Hi, good evening, everybody. I am Elizabeth, the director of the History Museum. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It's wonderful to see you. We like to begin all of our programs here at the Los Altos History Museum with a land acknowledgement. Uh, Los Altos History Museum does stand on the ancestral homeland of the native Ohlone people called Salmiye. We have been honored to be working with the Mwekma Ohlone for the last several years on their uh, land recognition efforts. And um, I think this program is a nice example of the sort of family lineage that is part of the Ohlone cultural heritage. And uh, so it's nice tonight to have a program that is about family and is about the, the legacies and the cultural traditions that we pass on from generation to generation. So um, I wanted to start with that land acknowledgement. Um, I also want to thank everybody on Zoom. Hello, we have a nice crowd of people joining us on Zoom. So thank you. And thank you all for being here tonight. It's wonderful to have people back in person at the Los Altos History Museum. Yay. <laughs> And um, as you might know, we are doing construction upstairs. So this gallery in particular has been a little quiet recently. And uh, we're so glad to have, uh, we brought out from storage some of the po posters from our Stegner exhibit that many of you might remember. Was anyone here for our original Stegner exhibit? I, and I know I do believe there are a couple people in the room that remember that exhibit well. So we're happy to have that out again tonight. Um, I am also very grateful for the sponsors for our outdoor Stegner exhibit that have joined us here tonight. Uh, Cal Water gave us a grant. Um, Paul Newhaven is here, gave us some, some assistance. Uh, Gary Hedden, let me see who else. Oh, Gary Westfield. <laughs> and Will Wyman, who was our guest curator and also helped support the exhibition. So we are grateful for everyone's support of that outdoor exhibition that we're doing. The museum is a nonprofit, as I'm sure you know, and we depend on the membership and the donations of our community to allow us to bring programs like this to the public. So thank you all so much for being a part of our membership family. Tonight's program, Stegner on Stegner, The Life and Writings of Wallace Stegner, is part of the museum's complimentary programming for our outdoor exhibition. So this is the first one, and we're so Hi. grateful, Lynn, for you kicking us Hi. off in such a wonderful way. Um, and we will be having a series of uh, hikes over the next, in November, and then we'll be having a program also in March. So we are looking forward to bringing more attention to the legacy of Wallace Stegner over the next several months. The exhibition will be out and available for 24 hours a day until March. So people have a lot of time to come and see the wonderful work of the exhibits team in putting together a unique outdoor exhibition called Wallace Stegner, A Path to Conservation. So I encourage you all to take a look at that exhibit. But tonight is a special opportunity to meet our, our guest, Lynn Stegner. Lynn has been working with us on our special exhibition, and we're really grateful for the time and the advice that you've been giving to us during this process. It's just been, yes, it was a wonderful introduction, and <laughs> we're really, really grateful. Stegner, uh, Lynn Stegner is the author of six works of fiction, which I believe were out and about outside, thanks to Georgiana's good blue thing to find all of your books. So those are outside, um, including novellas and a short story collection. Her work has received numerous awards, including the Faulkner Award for Best Novel for Because a Fire Was in My Head, which was also a New York Times Editor's Choice, a Book Sense pick, and a Literary Ventures selection. She wrote the extended critical introduction to her father-in-law's short fiction, Collected Stories of Wallace Stegner, and edited and wrote the foreword to the Penguin edition, Wallace Stegner, on teaching and writing fiction. I know many of us know his writing work in, at Stanford, and I'm sure that was quite an undertaking to write that introduction. <laughs> um, over the years, Lynn Stegner has enjoyed fellowships from the NEA, the Fulbright Society, and the Western States Arts Council, and they've all recognized her literary distinction in her work. She teaches novel and fiction writing for Stanford's continuing studies. Okay. So with that, I will turn the program over to Georgiana Shea, our museum educator, and um, and you're going to do conversation for me. Yes. All right. Good. Take it away. Thank you for being Thank here. You. Yes, we will be doing a Q&A at the end, but at first, I, I have lots of questions for Lynn. So <laughs> I just want to say before we do start out that 
when um, when Will came in and brought this idea to us, it was so great and in introduced us to Lynn. And I still remember our very first conversation. And I think, is it a literary thing where people say, oh, I have a muse? Um, you, you were our muse, honestly, oh. <laughs> for this uh, for this exhibit. You truly were. We all, and you were so giving of your time. And I remember one day, you I was writing you to ask for. I think you you proofed some of our text or all of our text and vetted it. And I said, and you're like, okay, I can do it now. I just met a deadline. So I'm just curious, was that for your? Um, for your new book, The Half-Life of Guilt, or was that for something else? That was for something else. Oh, okay. Else. <laughs> I did meet that deadline you did. <laughs> about a year ago. Okay, but yeah. Because that's just- Seems as if there's always a deadline. Right, I know. But yeah. you were always so, so thank you really from My all pleasure. these exhibits. But if I'm amused, do I have to buy a new wardrobe? Yes, you do. Wear something <laughs> sort of flowy. flowy. More flowy. Flowy, yes, that's exactly. What I that's what okay. you need. <laughs> so I know you weren't able to make it to our opening exhibit, but one one thing I I confess to, I have a deep, dark secret. I, until Will Wyman was gracious enough to come in and talk with us, I had never heard of Wallace Stegner. A hush just fell over. I know, people are shocked. <laughs> I know, look, we might need to get the resuscitation, you know. But um, I think a lot of that has to do with regional. I did not grow up in this area. I, I, you know, I think his ties with Stanford. So, and now I'm a huge fan. Honestly, I feel so lucky that I've had this experience. But I, I know I'm not alone because I would ask it. I would thought, is it just me? Am I the only? And there are a lot of people who have never heard of him, especially the younger generation growing up has <laughs> never heard of him. And he has made so many contributions. So I'm, I'm just curious. If you have any thoughts of why do not more people know about well, who he is and what, what amazing things he's done? Um, there is a complicated answer to that question. And uh, I think some of it now, now in the last 20 years has to do with what's happening in our literature and in the publishing industry in America. His books are translated into hundreds of other languages around the world, not hundreds, excuse me, I would say dozens of other languages. And they're selling well in other countries and in this country. Uh, but among the younger generations, because the books require a, a much more deeper engagement uh, and time, which American publishers are loath to recognize, um, but they, uh, they're not getting into the high schools and things. Some of them, there's one book in particular that would be a great high school book. Um, but I, I mean, judging by the numbers, there isn't any change in the numbers of sales over the last 20 years. But I can see, I understand your question. A lot of it has to do with the American publishing industry's fear of publishing serious literature. Interesting, yeah. And so, I, and this next follow-up question might be uh, a hard one. It might be like asking you to choose from your children, but do you have a favorite Wallace Stegner work or, or novel or essay? <laughs> I know it's a hard question. <laughs> no, I do have a favorite one and it's really easy for me to say. And it's one of the two books that was listed, the, one of the hundred best books of the 20th century. Wallace Stegner was the only one who had two books on that list. One of those two books, the other one, as I'm sure you all would guess, is Angle of Repose, but the other one is Wolf Willow. And that is my favorite book. And, and that is the book that would be a great choice for younger generations because you learn how to think about history in it. You learn how to understand personal history because it's part memoir. And the third part is the best piece of fiction he ever wrote, a novella called Genesis. And that is a, that is a tour de force. That 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 novella, and it's really an unusual format, is it? It's a Not, completely it's uh, so innovative unique. format. Nobody knew what to do with it when it first came out, but now it slots into, you know, all of the great and easiest things to sell. It's short. It, the memoir is now the number one selling genre in the world. The Nobel Prize laureate just was a memoirist, uh, and it has a short but incredibly dramatic piece of fiction that includes or that in, that um, recognizes landscape as a character within the text itself as a character and that's typical of west books from the west i'm curious who's 
who's in here has read that book? Yay. Okay. <laughs> who's going to go out and buy it now? Right? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. People just need to know, right? Yeah. It's a, yeah. it's a wonderful book. Yeah. So I know, um, so I, we, I guess we should say your relationship or how you came into this, this family. Um, we were married to Paige Segner. Yeah. Um, Paige was Mary and Wally's only son, uh, only child. And, and I'm married Paige. So that's how I'm, I'm, a half step removed so, just a half but yeah. but i want to know uh i read an interesting story about if you remember the first time you met wallace stegner oh let's see does any if anybody here has met wallace stegner would they forget the first time they met him <laughs> <laughs> um i i we we weren't married yet Paige and i um but i was invited we were invited to lunch at the house here in los altos hills and Wally was out on the deck wrestling with a cover for a new chaise long. Um, and because he was the ultimate conservator, he didn't want to waste this old frame. He wanted to make sure that he could reuse it. And uh, Mary was serving lunch and part of lunch was um, some sort of tomato dish. And I was being sort of chirpy and aspiring and wanting to be liked by my future parents-in-laws. And I made a comment about liking tomatoes, but being a little bit allergic to them because I have a twin brother and we had been in an orphanage in uh, Seattle, Washington. And it was an orphanage run by Italian nuns and they grew tomatoes. And that's what they served every day for lunch, which was tomato sandwiches. And, and Wally said very quietly, I think I was in the same orphanage. And, and in fact, he and his brother had been in the same orphanage 40 years earlier. Um, and, and he also did not like tomatoes much. So. <laughs> anyway, that's how, that was my, that was, and I didn't really make much of it at the time because I think I didn't at the time want to recognize that I actually had been in an orphanage with my twin brother. Um, but anyway, it, 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 what it turned out that we had been in. And not only that, he spent seven years growing up in Saskatchewan and my mother was from Saskatchewan. So we had some um, cross paths in our past. Well, yeah. it did strike me. You do have a lot of similarities and a lot of there are a lot of cross paths for sure, um, you know, and you're both authors and you're both, you know, you both love the outdoors, your, your love of, I think, crafting and um, does, did that, it seemed like you did have a special sort of bond with him. Well, I think, I would like to think so. Um, I mean, I knew he loved me. He, he walked me and gave me away to his son, which was kind of a nice gesture since I didn't have a father at the time. Um, and I actually, I wear a ring that um, Wally's father won in a poker game <laughs> in Salt Lake City in 1903. <laughs> and Mary never liked the ring because of the story. And I love the ring because of the story. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. You had said at one point, I, I emailed you and I said, Do you have the, I want to put a picture about you and Wally up on the website for this program. Can you send me a picture of you and Wally? And you said, you know, I've looked and I can't find one. And I said, and you, I don't know if you, I remember everything you say. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Hello. And you said, uh, I can't find any. We were too busy living our lives and living life to the fullest. We didn't stop to take photos. And I just think that was such an interesting, uh, especially where we are in it today, everybody's taking photos. So, yeah, I think it wasn't his medium and it certainly wasn't my medium. I think the only picture I, I actually have in my possession uh, is a picture that somebody took of us at San Miniato in Florence. That's it. Yeah. That's all I have. <laughs> but he, you, it was quite adventurous. I, mean, I think you were both quite adventurous, right? I mean, you shared that along I, with Paige. And, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. for sure. Um, so when I knew I was just starting to work on this project with Will, I, my neighbor came out, I was talking to her in my front yard, Cheryl, my neighbor, Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. I think she's watching on Zoom. And um, she said, oh, what are you doing now? And I'm like, oh, I just started working on this new exhibit and it's all on Wallace Stegner. And she went, 
and her, she kind of missed it over. Like she got this look and she's like, hmm. Wallace Stegner? I love Wallace Stegner. I've read every sing single one of his books and she's telling me and he changed my life and she started to cry. And I'm not, I'm not kidding, started to cry. And I was like, what have I got myself into? <laughs> because I'm like, you know, now you feel like you, I really better step it up because this gentleman means a, a lot, a lot, a lot to a lot of people. And so I think, you know, so I was thinking this exhibit that you're looking at was called Casting a Long Shadow. And it was done um, in 2005. And I think our curator is here tonight. Nan Geschke was our, our curator. Where's Nan? There she is. And, and if you go and want, look at, yes. So fabulous, fabulous, uh, amazing exhibit. Well, we were putting these up today. The exhibit team was like, these are really nice panels, even to, you know, how admiring them. But also there's some um, video interviews Nan did, thank goodness, with some uh, people from Green, Green, who started Green Foothills. So you documented them. If you go around, they are also, uh, we edited down some of that footage that Nan originally shot, and you'll find that in our exhibit um, as well. But I was thinking the title of this is Casting a Long Shadow. And indeed he did. He, he was a larger than life personality in many, many ways. And I think, so I'm just curious what, knowing the pressure I felt <laughs> just for this, what, you know, to, to um, have that name must be in some ways a blessing, in some ways a curse. Uh, it must be a dip, or, or did you find it difficult or is it? I did not. Yeah. I, mean, I just felt lucky all along. I think Paige, my husband, it was a tough. Time. So I think that that long shot for him, but not for me. I just, I, I was like being a grandparent of grandkid. You're not really responsible. You're just, you just get to enjoy it. And that's how I felt. And, and, and Wally was really good to me in my work. And that's what I was wondering. Did he ever give you advice or you and Paige um, advice on Right, being an author, the life of being an author. Not nothing about that. That's a scramble for any one of us who writes books. But uh, he definitely gave me technical advice for uh, about my first novel in terms of dealing with the narrative point of view, which needed to be changed. Uh, but I never felt oppressed by it. I just felt blessed. It's great. That, yeah. I think that speaks to him too. You know, yeah, he's, he was, <laughs> it does it does sound like that. He was a very graceful human being, for sure. So our first time we met, and we had a, a little round table um, talking about how we wanted this. This show is different than the two thousand and five show um, because we knew we couldn't live up to that show, Nan. So we <laughs> yeah. we we have to we have to go the total opposite way. So we. We focused all on on his conservation, um, and uh, and it was and I think it, it doesn't get overlooked, but I really do think people don't understand the impact that that he had on conservation in a big way. Um, and and one of the things I had I have, I still have my giant sticky I wrote it on when you were talking, huh. but you had said he created a new vocabulary for conservation. And I thought at that point, I didn't quite understand what you were saying, but now I, under, I understand it better that he really, he was the first, one of the first modern conservationists. So I'm just wanted you to speak maybe a little bit to what, what, what made him so passionate about that? What, why was he such a great advocate for the environment? And Well, I mean, he had, he, it, was his, it was his home turf. So he had a real personal stake in it. But also growing up in a landscape that is defined by aridity, and that it, and, and that aridity it can also be a very painful reality. For instance, when he and his family were trying to raise wheat on the Saskatchewan prairies, um, that that reality is, is right on your front step. And and nobody, you know, many people east of the. Mississippi don't understand the the defining the er dynamic the rule uh, monger of aridity, and so he took it upon himself to help articulate 
um, what it means when you don't have enough water to grow things without irrigation. That's what the 100th meridian is about, is that meridian. Anything west of that, you've got to irrigate to grow. Anything east of it is gonna grow on its own, very likely, maybe not anymore, but, and, and so I, I think that it was just, you know, this, the pains and scars that he experienced and the, uh, his frustration with trying to communicate that to uh, a government, to a populace that didn't really understand what aridity means and getting over, as he said, we've all got to get over the color green. It's not green out here, it's brown and it's brown for a reason. Uh, so I, I, I think I think he had a personal stake and then of course it became just, what can I do? And he was a real a believer in law. His mic just went off. I think you're okay. I just um, And so he tried to, you know, change those laws from the inside by working with Stuart Udall, by getting on the boards or being invited on the boards of the Wilderness Society, all of these um, these big uh, land conservation groups. But I think people don't realize how strategically smart he was. I think the one, this is in the exhibit, but it's the seven page letter he wrote to Ansel Adams prior to the Stanford talk where they he wrote, he said, and then you're going to talk about this. And I'm going to, basically all the talking points. He was just very, I was just struck by how smart and strategic he was about getting things done yeah. for conservation. Well, I think that if you are going to cast your lot with the law, you have to be strategic. You can't just be uh, tilting at windmills, windmills with, you know, a, a long lance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one more question, then I'm going to open it up because I'm sure you all have lots of questions. Um, but I was just, you know, one of the threads that runs through everything is his sense of place. And um, and I think uh, I was telling Lynn before we were walking around and the, the sense of place bench, we call it over there, it does have meaning. We were hopefully thoughtful with that. that that's from a redwood lot that was at Hillview Community Center when they uh, enlarged it, was taken down and it was left um, at, it's, was it our city maintenance, Gary? City maintenance yard. So we found, Gary and Pat found a great artist, created a, a beautiful bench out of that. And I, I always think, oh, I think he would have liked that. Oh, you absolutely. Know, you know, because it has its sense of place, it's still here. But that sense of place, I, from my, from my understanding, kind of came out of a, um, a difficult childhood really and is is that kind of a thread that sort of do you think the ch his childhood was what led to sense of place or i mean the it, he had a childhood that was a pretty typical of his times in terms of wandering from or moving from one boom and bust town to the next to try to scrabble together a living so it was um should I? No, you can't, Elizabeth, you need to leave that down. Uh, anyway, so I think that wanting a home, a home that is, that has some semblance of permanence, um, and at the same time needing to keep moving on left him in a permanent state of yearning for place, yearning back and forward for place. I think this is partly why his um, devotion to the place in Vermont was a uh, part of his life because Vermont changes very little, especially this little village in Northern Vermont. And so it, it, um, it rhymed with the dreams that he had for a home that wasn't going to change, which at that time in the West was not possible. And you still, you go there still yes. every right? <laughs> yeah, we built a log house out of trees that Paige and Wally planted when Paige was 12 years old. It was part of Vermont's reforestation project. We harvested 300 red pine and had them milled and planed and had some people help us get it up. And Wally was very fond of saying we grew a house. <laughs> <laughs> And we did grow a house, in fact. <laughs> now that's your sense of place. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> lovely. Well, 
I have monopolized you long enough. So is there, are there any questions? Anybody have any questions? Yes, and I'll probably repeat it so they can hear it at home okay. as well. So I'll just repeat it so that people on Zoom can hear. The question was uh, asking about the um, on seven South Fork. One, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Wally's uh, house, Wally and Mary's house um, off of Page Mill, what happened to it? And is there anything left of it? Um, it was sold. Uh, Paige and I sold it reluctantly. Um, we tried to actually get Stanford to buy it. Uh, so that it could become a, re it was not a big house and certainly not a grand house, but it was beautifully situated. And we, we hoped that Stanford would buy it and let it become a writer's retreat for visiting scholars and visiting writers. And Stanford said, um, you know, we're, we, we, we would buy it or you're happy, welcome to, to make that arrangement with us but we aren't going to keep it. We're just going to sell it and add the money to the endowment at Stanford. And so we decided that wasn't what we wanted. Um, so we ended up selling it. And uh, and then for a while, the California Historic Society got involved and tried to have it preserved as a historical monument. And there was a one year long kerfuffle about that. And in the end, um, it was, they lost and uh, a, a very wealthy family or uh, group from Hong Kong tore the house down and put up a pretty big house of some kind. My understanding, I don't know if it's true, but I heard the studio was still standing. It's not. No, oh, okay. there was a beautiful blue oak in front of the studio oh, and I hope it's still there. I think maybe that's what it was. Um, and I'm, I hear we're doing, um, I can't remember the date, next Saturday or Sunday, we're doing a walk on the Wall Stegner pathway, which actually you should probably tell that story too, because that's a, <laughs> but um, my understanding is there's a new pathway that goes in the back of that house that kind of goes oh. by that blue oak. I'm going to oh. have to find out. Yeah. Okay. That would be nice. Yes. Yeah. That yeah. would be nice to know. <laughs> Do you want to tell them the, the pathway? Wall of Stegner oh, the pathway, pathway is just... <laughs> Mary was a charming um, lawbreaker of small laws. And <laughs> one of the laws in at that time was that if you weren't a resident of Palo Alto, you couldn't walk on some of the trails up that were right behind Mary and Wally's house. But Mary ignored that rule. And they got kicked off of that path pretty regularly. <laughs> And then after he died, um, they named the path after him, which would probably not make him very happy at this point. But now I think, oh, but on that Sunday, I'm, we're going to take 20 people and read read his some of his words on that path. Yeah, so okay. I hope he would like that. Yeah, anyway. sure. That makes amends. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. It's not really a question. Um, this is kind of a history night. And I wanted to, I brought Nancy Packer along. Huh? And Wally, he hired Nancy. They shared an office together at Stanford. And then when he left the creative writing program, Nancy took over for many years. And so I told her about this. And uh, she's living at uh, Sunrise now down in Palo Alto. And she said, well, I'd like to go. I Good. Wally. I mean, this is one of my yeah. Wow. And Nancy, it is so nice to meet you. You are quoted on one of our panels. Your your <laughs> your words are you're you're an in infamy now. He out there. Yes. She used to sit at that desk. <laughs> well, it's a, definitely a pleasure. You came up a lot in in our research, so definitely a pleasure to meet you. Problem is, I can't hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll just do this. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, Dan. Yeah.
both Wally and Mary and also on their friend, but I can't remember what the friend's name was. The uh, Phil and Peg Gray family in Vermont and their kids. And uh, the original title of that book was Amicidia, which means friendship. And it's an, an unusual novel. And by the way, it's it's the biggest selling book to, of his books today. Um, because multi, there are not many books written about friendship, a whole novel about friendship. And, and the terrain, uh, the sometimes rocky terrain of friendship, but it was about this friendship that he had, they had with the, with the Gray family, um, whom they met in Madison, uh, Wisconsin, and then um, the Gray family who had a lot of property in Greensboro, Vermont, where our place is, um, it persuaded them to come, and then Mary and Wally built a little cabin, and one thing led to another, and so that, that's, the, that's the name of the family. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, Will. I think it's uh, important to Los Alpha and it's a work uh, all the little live things in place in the Green Woodhouse, which uh, we're fortunate Wally has seems to reject. Uh, there's good advocacy and work with the Post and Big and all those. But I didn't know about the character of all the little life cat. Now, who the heck is cat? <laughs> okay, I'm going to repeat that. So the question was about all the little live things. Um, who was in real life Peck, the character Peck? I mean, I'm knowing Wally and knowing some of his relationship with Ken Kesey, and which was which was sort of benignly disputatious. Um, I'm sure that Peck was a composite of the people like Kesey, like Ed McClanahan and like Ed Abbey that Wally had to deal with in the writing program who were just to his thinking renegades. Um, and he wanted to talk about, you know, this phenomenon of, you know, sort of contrary lawlessness. But also he had a deep frustration with with the tactics of the 60s. And, uh, you know, we've he said we've become a, a plywood university because they had broken so many windows at Stanford that they had to put plywood over the windows. And this was a time that really uh, frustrated and and um, I would say dispirited Wally. And I think it probably eventually led to his his uh, leaving Stanford in 1971, because he was just fed up with the, the protests and the riots and things. And so I think Peck was part of his protest. <laughs> <laughs> I will say too, just because there's a lot of controversy and I, the one interview, he, he did not resign, uh, retire as Stanford likes to say, is that correct? He was, res he resigned. Yeah, he resigned. Right. Because he was so sort of disillusioned with what was yeah. going on. Yeah. yeah. Yes, questions. Yes. <laughs> Good. I have another question for you. I'm just your your latest book, um, The Half Life of Guilt. It seems, and I haven't read it yet, but I will. <laughs> when did that come out? It just it hasn't come out. That's yet. why I couldn't. Yeah. I tried to yeah. get it. I'm like, I no. can't get it. I can't. There's read no it. pop quiz. Yet. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> when, when I used to write Lynn emails, I said I would take hours to compose them because she write. You are like Wally. Her her emails and her vocabulary are just beautiful, and and so I would 
go through and I said one day, I'm like, I'm very nervous. I feel like every email I write, you correct with a red pen. And she's so gracious that I threw that out years ago. So, <laughs> but your new book, it's, it seems, it, it does have sort of a conservation. Yeah, actually as well. that is my, uh, you know, my eco book as they say, but it happens that some years ago in the late nineties, Paige and I were involved in trying to stop uh, Mitsubishi from uh, building a new salt works in Scammons Lagoon, which is on the west coast of Baja, California. Um, there was already a, the biggest salt works in the world in Guero Negro, but in the next lagoon south, with the last remaining untouched lagoon where the gray whales breed, they were going to put another salt works down there. And so there was an international uh, outcry about this and we got very involved in trying to stop it and we did stop it. <laughs> and uh, so this story was partly based on the, the, the pretty amazingly dramatic, sometimes scary process of going down there and interviewing people and going out to Cedros Island and, and dealing with people who didn't want other countries involved and it wasn't just Americans it was people from all over the world got involved in in stopping this I trust I, I look forward to reading that it sounds, <laughs> Thank sounds, you. sounds fascinating I don't know yet yeah it's still <laughs> being shopped around as they say yeah <laughs> any other questions yes sir follow up on what you said about writing we have a summer house in Maine and so last year Dr. Angel learned a NATO huh. and died in a hundred. Huh. And if you sat down and talked to him, he would talk to anybody. But before you did that, you had to screw your courage <laughs> to talk to someone like that. Your thoughts on that? Not at all. <laughs> I mean, I felt intimidated just because. I loved him and I, I wanted him to, you know, feel good about me, but, but he was just easy and gracious and graceful. And, um, and if he disapproved of something, he gave you the benefit of his silence. <laughs> 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 yeah. And what, and he gave me one good, good, lots of good pieces of advice, but one of them was never accidentally insult which I thought was a brilliant piece of advice. If you're going to insult somebody, be sure to do it intentionally. <laughs> he said, I know Paige, Paige Stegner and the, your husband in that lecture that I was talking about earlier with you in private was saying that when he went back and looked at all those letters, that's a great book. And I'm like, the, tell me the official name. I it's just, a selected letter. Yeah. yeah well if you stated. really want an insight that, that book is amazing. Um, it's uh, how many hundreds of letters are in there um, to all kinds of people. You really get an insight into the family and, and to Wallace Stegner. It's it's really amazing. But uh, it's called the, the Selected Letters of Wallace Stegner. And we yeah. are carrying it in the museum gift shop. We have that. Yeah. I think it's for sale tonight. We have it here. But yeah. really great, great I can't say nothing. <laughs> it's such a good book. It was so good. But um, what Paige said was when he went back and reviewed those uh, letters, that the one thing he noticed that he didn't notice when he was younger was how funny his father was, uh -huh. like his sense of humor. And um, yeah, I was wondering. Yeah, he was witty, uh, witty in a very, um, you know, smart way. I wouldn't say he was I mean, he wasn't funny because funny is a sloppy word, but he was extremely witty. And it, about two hours after you ran into him, you'd think, oh, <laughs> I just got that. <laughs> so great. Cool. Okay, questions? Yes. How did you meet Paige? Uh, he, he, he was teaching at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and I had just graduated and he knew I had gotten a fellowship to the Squaw Valley community of writers. And he, uh, he asked me to bring some books up to the guy who used to run that program, Oakley Hall. And that's how we met. I was the carrier of books. Nate. <laughs> yes. Yes. Nate. Yeah. Like, 
so to give us a background about the people that were involved as charter members of the Committee for Green Criminals, because I know that was so important to all. You know, I I met them when um, everybody was pretty elderly and they were mostly just friends in their, you know, in their circle, they were like Ruth and Spangenberger and others. And so I, I, I wish I could, but I can't, I just don't have enough data. I will say, Dan, it, that's the clip that I used from your interview yeah. with Don. Right. They were a very influential group of people who, you know, kind of stem the yeah in terms of the building on the hill. We'll come back. Lenny Roberts is going to be here with the new executive director of um, Green Foothills on March fourth. So. That's we can we can pick her brain too. Let's see. Yeah, that's a better brain yeah. to pick on that topic. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, I do want to ask where he was buried. I had heard he did not want to be buried in Glen because he was so disappointed with what had happened. So the uh, the question is where where is he buried? Yeah. So his ashes are scattered uh, partly in Los Altos Hills. And and then they the the rest were um, in Vermont, and that we have a we have a stone in a little graveyard on the other side of the lake, which he a, a graveyard that he liked, and Mary's there and Paige is there now too. And the bench right was that was the memorial up on the uh -huh. line as yeah. well. There's the memorial bench up, up there. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Any other questions? No. Yes. How did he divide his time between Vermont and Los Altos Hills? Right. How did he divide his time between Vermont and Los Altos Hills? I mean, in the early days when they were in, they they were sort of experiencing a kind of love affair with Greensboro, they would spend as much time as they could. If he had a sabbatical and summers, of course, and then things sort of settled down a little bit, and so he was just spending summers. So you know three or four months every summer, which is basically what we do still. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think it's so fascinating to talk <laughs> with you for so many reasons. And and we look forward to, uh-oh, be careful. <laughs> we look forward to um, all of, uh, actually, Lynn was gracious enough. She's going to stay after. We do have some of her her, her books for sale and um, Wall Stegner's books, and she's happy to sign books. She said mm -hmm. for us, so she'll be she'll be outside afterwards. Um, I hope you enjoy the exhibit. It's a very dense exhibit. It has a lot of media. Come back again and again. Um, there's a lot of rare pieces in there: the letters, the audio files, um, all kinds of little. Nobody's looked in the desk drawers, but I hid things in the desk drawers too, people. So there's lots of little things around. Um, in other words, don't be respectful. No, Just open be those like Mary, drawers. Right? <laughs> right? Break the rules. Break the rules. <laughs> and I, I think about a month we're having a, um, a collateral. Is that a good word? You're better with words. A collateral exhibit. Another exhibit in Smith House. <laughs> that this is why I'm not a writer. Sure. <laughs> um, another exhibit in Smith House upstairs that's going to be focused more on his literature. Um, so it we're, it's kind of piggybacking on this on on conservation. So you can all come back for that. We really appreciate you supporting the um, the museum, and we're very proud of this exhibit. We thank Lynn again for all of her help in this. And we want to congratulate George and Lynn as well. <laughs> Thank you.